All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, today's talk is Rebar 3. I'm Tristan Slaughter. That's Frank Herbert. From uh, We're both from Heroku. You probably know Fred from uh, Learn You Some Erlang. Great book. If you haven't read it, read it. And we're going to be talking about the new build tool uh, we've been working on, Rebar 3. Yeah. And one of the questions, well, let me start off with, since so many people raised their hand, they're the first time they've he uh, they're here, is how many people have not used Rebar? Right. So you're still uh, sane in some ways. Yeah. So good. Like, uh, <laughs> Who I here? Would, yeah. Who here has had issues with rebar as it is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Better. This isn't. This is an easy sell then. So yeah, it actually turned out to be an easier sell than I thought. When we started the project of essentially blowing away what was in rebar, except for some very core components, I was I was worried, but it turned out to work out pretty well. And allow the full screen. The it's going to go away. So Rebar introduced a number of really useful things uh, to the Erlang development community. It was, it was portable and convenient. You could just, it was an e-script that you could just put into your repo, so anybody that downloaded could start building right away. It wasn't a complicated make file or confusing to install Sanan. It just worked once you had it. And it was developed by... Uh, very smart people at Basho, and they're building very complicated uh, applications and releases. So it had massive amounts of features and uh, test suites and fairly good documentation. But it basically had run its course. Like all good software, it ends up getting rewritten. That's what happens. And maintainership was handed over to uh, Fred and I at Heroku from Basho, and we initially were just sort of maintaining Rebar 2. Try and yeah. Trying. Trying to maintain <laughs> Rebar 2. And it was problematic. Uh, the, well, I mean, one of the first things I did was close hundreds of tickets, I think, that were over four months old, and people were upset with that. Yeah, many of them were still valid, but there was like 150 of them open, and we had no idea where to start, so we just closed yep. everything that was old, and if it was important, we would reopen them again. Turns out that maybe 80 tickets were closed for good that time, so it yep. ended up being good for us. Yeah, good, but it showed uh, there, there was a problem in maintainership over the years that it wasn't going places it needed to go, and features like update depths were simply completely broken, and they weren't going to be able to work in the current uh, structure of how rebar worked. So we knew we needed to start from a new place. And rebar 3 had some main objectives we started out with of we want to make files were everywhere. Everybody has a make file for the rebar because you have to do rebar get depths, compile, all this stuff to do anything that actually works. A number of features like dialyzer aren't there anymore, so you have to have a make file to have your complicated dialyzer command. We want to get rid of that. So th you still might have a make file for uh, compiling your C code if you have a NIF or something, or if you have a really complicated uh, program structure, you might even have Java in there and stuff. So you might have a make file. But for the majority of use cases, you should not need one and should not have one. We also went with OTP or nothing. Uh, it discovers your applications, and it builds them. And it knows what they are, whether they're dependencies or they're just your project apps that you're working on. No traversing into all the directories to say, hey, what is this? Should I compile this? Is this Erlang? Is this a protobuf? Is this whatever? No. OTP structure, find the apps, build them. We wanted to be so easy in that sense that there's no, uh, you know, if a command like compile needs dependencies, it will get your dependencies. You don't have to, it won't just complain, because everybody hates a tool that says, hey, you needed to run me to install dependencies first. I'm like, well, if you know that, why aren't you just running it for me? Just do it. You're, yeah, you're a computer. Uh, and predictable. I think predictable is the most important one that we really focused on 
and Rebar 2 had problems with is that we wanted predictable builds that would be reproducible everywhere. Yeah. And that was a major problem, especially with update depths and, and well, anything, because everybody used master for their dependencies. But <laughs> uh, that and extensibility, and, but predictability, I think, is uh, one thing we're going to really hammer on, uh, and Fred will talk about more in a minute. So the roadmap, we are currently at alpha 2. So we've been at alpha, and we've had a number of uh, fixes go in. Uh, it's looking pretty good. I mean, we've got packages, common test, e-unit, all the good things with dialyzers back. Uh, so it's definitely usable, uh, and people are using it. We're using it at Heroku, so it works. There, there's going to be still a number of bugs, so just open an issue. We're fairly, fairly responsive on IRC or uh, just on GitHub. So hopefully we'll get any kinks worked out soon, and we can introduce beta and finally get to a final release, which the ultimate goal would be to be Rebar 2 compatible with plugins. So any issue with you know, proto buffs or any, any thing we ultimately took out because it wasn't a core of compiling an OTP app right, yeah. is, it, is there. It's ultimately very hard for us to maintain features we do not use. And we're going to have a very bad service, bad features, bad implementations if we do it that way. So everything that we personally don't use in any of our projects like that, uh, we've taken out. And we expect plugins to replace them. So yeah, what about source dependencies? Source dependencies were uh, <laughs> somewhat working well with rebar and somewhat working terribly. So part of the problems we had, well, they were a bit verbal. So we have this simpler form that's now introduced. Uh, you still can depend on something in Git with the Git protocol, Git with HTTPS. We kept uh, Mercurial in place, HTTPS and SSH. All of these are seen as equivalent, so you don't have the problem of trying to update a dependency. But because the format of the URL changed, everything explodes all the time. Now, this is a simple format, but it's not the one we recommend. And actually, if you use one of these, you're going to get a warning uh, telling you to please one of these. So instead, what we want you to do is use a, um, where's my hand here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you can use a reference that points to a direct hash. You can use a tag directly for that to point at one of these over a branch specifically. And each of these, I mean, can be, mut uh, can be mutable except the reference itself. So every time we do a checkout and lock the dependencies, we extract the underlying reference so that the next time someone builds it from the lock file that we now build automatically, uh, it's going to have the right revision that you want unless someone went and deleted that stuff. And those are really important for uh, updates because if you simply put a tag but you don't put that it is a tag, we don't know if it's a tag or a branch. So doing an update, we don't know if it means you're actually wanting to go somewhere else or it needs to stay the same. It's really important to have those if you want source dependencies to work correctly. Right, yeah. We, we don't really support anymore the one where you just replace the entire bit here by just master or the name of something. Well, we do support it, but it, you, you shouldn't expect good results from that. Uh, we want to keep it because of backwards compatibility, such as these features. So Rebar 2 had all of these things where you can put a version, delete it, so raw dependency, or both. Um, and we support it, and we don't support it anymore in that we accept the format, but we just ignore it entirely. Rebar 3 has a change in that we don't give a crap about your versions that you use. It's purely for people. The raw thing, we currently ignore it. No reason to bring it back that we've seen so far. Uh, but yeah, we just ignore it so that all existing libraries, or most of them at least, that don't depend on C or protobufs, can still build and can still be used. Uh, it would be very, very hard to drive adoption on a project that kills the entire open source community that we have so far. Um, yeah. Library versions are hell. So I mentioned that Rebar doesn't use versions. We don't trust them. And the reason is simple is that instead of having a new tool that we apply to the community and then people subscribe to it, we come into a community that already does everything wrong, which is the airline community. Uh, the branches we have are bad. The tags we have are bad. The app file versions that we have are bad. They don't necessarily match together. It's possible you have the tag v1.0.1, but inside the app file, it's still in 0 0.9. It doesn't have the v. The format is not the same. It's absolutely not usable. And it's hard to really describe what would be a canonical version for us to use on a uh, source file. And if you go into places like Mercurial, a branch and a tag is somewhat vague as a reference. You can have both, but eh. So it, it's really, really hard. 
the semantics and taxonomy are not clearly defined in existing projects. People can do whatever version they want, and nobody in the community has told you before to please use semantic versioning. A lot of us have, are trying to do it, and we still do it wrong, but we're trying to do it, and we can't force people to do everything and please revisit all the versions of all the libraries in the world. I, people have suggested we do that, and I just told them that I don't have the time to do it, and Tristan doesn't, hit, doesn't have it either. So we just don't care about that. So you we say I don't have a life, or that I don't have the time? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that means we don't do semantic versioning, and every time people ask us if we're going to do it, the answer will be no. Uh, just as an example, we decided to go into HexPM because it's part of the package management we do. Tristan's going to talk about that. And we looked into the 956 libraries in there, and uh, only 100 of them have a version that is not 0 point something. And semantic versioning, a version be below 0 point something, means that you cannot infer anything about the version. You cannot use it to match anything. If you don't do that, well, technically, you're not doing proper semantic versioning. Semantic versioning also tells you that if the app is in production, it should be 1.0.0. So what we have is either a community that generally doesn't have a lot of production apps, or a community that doesn't respect semantic versioning, even if they have that as a policy. So we just don't trust versions. We don't trust programmers. We're a terrible breed of people. We just go without it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have that little X. As someone who puts a lot of code in production that is not 1.0. Yeah. I mean, we probably <laughs> do it all the time ourselves. What are you going to do? Uh, what's my... I forgot where it was. Fetching dependencies, yes. So instead of actually doing stuff, we have <laughs> just recorded it in advance. Never do live coding. It will always fail. Record it. Right, right, right. OK. So we are in that file, and we declare a dependency. In that case, it's cowboy with a given tag. It's going to be really simple. Uh, there is a package in there that we have that we know is in there. It's going to cover what Tristan's going to talk soon. So we have these two formats. Uh, we save the config file. You can ignore everything else that's in there. It's uh, for different demonstrations. Oh, yeah. I forgot I needed to do that. Good thing I recorded it. That's some vim. Yeah. Yeah, we add the dependency in the file itself so that we're going to be able to build stuff with it a bit later, but yeah. And then when we run to call it, it's just rebar3. And you'll notice here that uh, it's in the actual system path. This is something we want people to start possibly doing a bit more, uh, which is stop bundling rebar in every freaking dependency. Because at some point, you build a release that has 50 apps, and you have 50 copies of rebars, and only one of them is being used. So if you have a rebar 3 to ship with an application, make it in the top level one that ships the system, not in all the smaller ones. Uh, if you have plugins and stuff like that, there's a way to configure it so it gets bundled with everything, and it's going to be fine. So we fetch dependencies. This is super slow because it was my connection back home. It's a bit slower than here, maybe, sometimes. The internet's farther away in Canada. So you see here. Uh, Cowboy was being fetched entirely fine. Cowboy depends on Cowlib and Ranch and doesn't use the notation for branch or whatever like that. We get the warning, and then it compiles the other code, compiles all the dependencies in order, and then my app is built. What's interesting is that we have this application structure that we decided to use because we're very, very fed up with rebar just putting everything at the top level dependencies, having to maintain an annoying ignore file. Everything is in underscore build. So when you go in there, uh, there's a default build, and all the libraries that we have compiled are going to be in that one, and then it's done. Everything else is on the top level. You just have to ignore that directory and nothing else. Any questions about that? Yeah, I meant to start at the beginning. It's like, if anything seems weird or wrong, bring up questions now. We'll have Q&A at the end, but just yeah. don't wait if something strikes you as very wrong. So conflict resolution. Uh, everyone here has had what we call the mech hell sooner or later, where you have all your dependencies are running tests, and you all have a proper version of a mech version of a cowboy version, and everyone depends on a slightly different version. And rebar to explode in your place and tells you that there's a conflict, please resolve it. And you have to go and fork everything, put them all on the same version, and try to fetch them again. It's a terrible experience overall. So because we don't give a crap about versions anymore, uh, we're able to do lever order traversal, which means that when we fetch your dependencies, uh, we start at the app at the top, and everything that comes back as a duplicate, we show a warning, but we don't download anymore. 
Uh, that gives us something that is entirely uh, predictable. So if I have this application in pink, uh, what was it? No, it's anyway, and then I have the dependency A and the dependency B, B in order A is going to be fetched, B is going to be fetched, I'm going to look at the, child, the children of these applications, then I'm going to look at C, then at D1, and I'm going to build them and fetch them. Uh, at that point, C has a dependency on D2, but D1, which is the first version of D, has already been downloaded at the level above. So what we do when that happens, we just don't download D2, we show a warning, and whatever C would have had at the bottom there that would have been a cycle could have been detected because we do cycle detection now to avoid rebar going in the loop forever, but it doesn't happen because we never needed D2. If I really, really wanted to have D2, uh, I can just bring D2 at the top level of my rebar file, and just because it's higher in their hierarchy, it's going to resolve the conflict automatically. And what is interesting about that is that by doing this, we have allowed us to fix for good the upgrade feature that now works and is predictable. The thing that everyone would just blow away their depths and redownload all of them every single time is gone for good. And I can't say how happy I am about that. <laughs> So I'm in that file. I'm There's people actually clapping. <laughs> 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 Upgrades work. That's how far behind we've been with tooling. <laughs> yeah, so in that case, I'm trying to update Cowboy to a new version in the dependencies I had. I'm moving from 1.0.1 to something else. Uh, I have the upgrade command for that. If I try to upgrade wrench, it tells me that I can't do it. We cannot upgrade transient dependencies because it doesn't make sense. Those are dependencies that I have never specified in that project. The only dependencies I have specified in my project are at the top level. So if I want to upgrade a dependency, I have to bring it to the top level or upgrade a top level dependency. So in that case, I'm updating Cowboy. Uh, it's giving me the same warning. The new version of Wrench has been downloaded. Every other dependency I had has been left untouched. Insane. And if I remove transient dependencies and the structure explodes, it gets to work fine. Yes? Does this apply just to version numbers, or does this apply to Git URLs as well? Does this apply to version numbers or to Git URLs as well? So the version numbers that we use uh, are to fetch tags or branch or references, and what we do is use the underlying reference. So when we have a tag version or something, we compare the tag version that is now in the config file you have with the hashes that are on disk in the app that has been fetched. And if they differ and the app has been specified to need an upgrade, we upgrade that. Otherwise, if it resolves to the same commit, we don't need to touch it. It hasn't changed. Right. So if your .app file has version 1 and you say do an upgrade and master that you now relied on has gone forward and commits but now says 0.5, that's still an upgrade, because we assume that nobody puts the right versions in anything. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was thinking more about if I've got completely different git remotes. Like, I, I have external so, build server with completely Right. It, it checks that. So what, what it, it considers a diff, uh, uh, it considers a change between your lock file and your uh, rebar config if that remote changes, and it, che it sees what it needs to do. Yeah, so it's going to check. And it will, it will simply get the new version that you've set instead of what Rebar 2 would do, which I don't know if anybody even knows. Probably just blow up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's the overall mechanism, and so far we've been able to use it without a problem. We have an upgrade mechanism that finally works, which is pretty cool because I was tired of redundant. Yeah, no, I don't know if anybody else, I've never used the upgrade depths because it just never worked for years. Yeah, and then it, th use it once and then you find out that it doesn't work and then you never use it again. And then I, we were developing Rebar 3 and I was working in on a project at work, and I was like, oh, I need a new version of this. Like, let me try this. And I, I ran it, and it worked. The lock file was updated and everything. <laughs> By golly, we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, we mentioned packages. Uh, you don't need to rely anymore on uh, Git repos unless you absolutely have to. I mean, I think that's always an important thing to have. It's like you should never not have the option to fall back to uh, some either bleeding edge or just some random person's Git repo that they never bothered to make a package out of, even though you could do it yourself. Uh, 
So a new syntax that uh, Fred actually already showed, uh, stealing my thunder, in uh, his presentation, that just a name and a version. Uh, the version actually does mean something here, uh, but it's not, you'll notice there's not going to be any uh, like greater than or less than. It, it's used in the same way that versions are used in the source dependency uh, resolution. Tags and everything. Right. The first one you find is the highest level is, uh, is the winner. So you can simply say also cowboy and it will get the newest. Uh, but here, just say cowboy 1.0.0. And it will get it. And right now they are uh, their source dependencies. And as I mentioned, package versions are for humans, not rebar three. So it won't uh, care much yeah. about. It. That's just about identifying the package. Yeah. The end lesson there is that nobody does version rights, so we decided not to trust anyone with versions. Like nothing in rebar uses versions except as an indicator of what resource to fetch ultimately, but there's never any conflict resolution that uses that. It's simply a reference of this is a unique snowflake. So you want this one, you get it. Yes. Does it resolve the shot every time or like someone forces the back? Oh, uh, so back to source dependencies. We're on package dependencies now. But no, so it actually, it, it doesn't every time. What it does is, it, but if you want to do like an upgrade, because it is the, the SHA in the lock file, it will check if those have changed. So right. if, if you say do an upgrade and in your rebar config you have master set, it checks that, okay, those have changed, I should do an upgrade. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all packages go into your project directory. We're keeping the same, uh, basically, sandboxed environment that everything is installed to underscore build, and that's what you work from. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if you're actually using rebar, there's a couple useful command. Uh, packages will list all the packages that are available. If you do this today, you will get a whole bunch of Elixir packages uh, that will not install. I mean, they'll download and they'll fail to compile. Uh, if someone wants to write a nice plugin that makes uh, that not a problem, if you really want an Elixir package, that would be awesome. Just saying. No. Update, it will update your package index. Uh, an important thing that uh, I'm very strict about is it only goes to the internet if it absolutely, if the user asks it to. So if there's so running compile will go to the internet because the user is asked to, co to compile something that it told it these are the compiled dependencies and they are on the internet. But other than that, it will not, except for like update, which has to, will fetch the new registry and uh, change what packages are available. And all this is based on hex PM from Eric right there. A really great uh, it's an, it started as uh, an Elixir uh, package manager, and we're hoping to combine forces for the greater good. And, and yeah. fewer work, less work for ourselves because we don't have to write one from scratch. Yeah, we're also lazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, yeah, it, it'll be, uh, yeah. They've done a lot of great work in, pa uh, whatever you think of Elixir. They've done a lot of great, great work in tools, not just in package managing, but building. That is great to be able to unite forces and really move this along. We've done the same for releases uh, with HexRM that uses Relx, and we've been communicating to try to make that uh, as good of a combination as we can, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Right now, it's all uh, source-based, so still when you get your package, it compiles it. Uh, my dream world is binaries, which I found has been the greatest pushback uh, from the community on, which I found odd. Like, if you have an OTP app, I want an OTP app and its beams. Uh, I rarely have special different compilation for certain apps that, that matter. So. That's an interesting one. Uh, I think if we provide it as an option, it's going to be good. I really hope th that that would make all Beam uh, languages be able to work together, because you could still get an Elixir project and never have to worry 
Right. You can build it, and you could get a rebar two project and not have to worry if it builds with rebar three's slight changes in configuration because it would just already be compiled. Right, and well, if it's beam, it would be portable at the same time. It would just be faster overall. Yep. Oh, another question from Chad. Where do we store the beams? Do they be centrally Where do we store the beams? Uh, I was thinking in the distributed hash table, like Bitcoin. I'm going to put it in the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, right now, I mean, it's the same. Uh, Eric's already been working on some of this uh, for Hex. It, I mean, it's all stored right now in S3, but I mean, it's an interchangeable storage layer. But yeah, right now, packages are stored in S3, and the Beam ones would be in the same place. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's obvious uh, different buckets and stuff like that, uh, keys. Yeah, uh, there, there's still work on going for that. And uh, you can use packages and source dependencies at the same time in the same project. That's why they use the same resolution rules. And at the same time, a source application will always have the precedency over a package yeah. application. Yeah. Yeah, I skipped that point. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important one. Yeah, Zach. Uh, if we will be able to say no action on the one the binary. Put it at the top level. Yeah, you need to put it on the top level if you want that. That's the override mechanism we have. You want it top level, you want it to be pr taking precedence, you put it at the top level. Because otherwise, uh, Rebar 3 just goes through source dependencies and then package dependencies to fetch what is not there yet. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be the answer always, too. I mean, How do I get it to fetch this one? Have you tried putting it at the top level? And Yeah, I mean, eventually it will be nice if more people end up moving to packages. We won't need to worry about that, and source will always be yeah. there. But if we had to flip that mechanism at some point, there's never a way to get back to source dependencies. Yeah, but I, I think it's an important point to, mention, to make sure the transient dependencies are still overridden by source dependencies. So if you're using a uh, package cowboy, you can have a specific source ranch, and that will be used, and it won't be overwritten by uh, the binary package. But you'll still get that binary cowboy. Right. But yeah, overall, if you want to configure something special, it, it goes into your top-level configuration file. So at that point, you just put the dependency you want there, and you get the same result. So yeah, what about the test depths? We mentioned um, our friend Mech a few times. There's proper that's kind of the same. Uh, you saw in the little screencast recording thingy that we have this kind of big blob in there. And this is a new configuration element that Rebar 3 understands that is called profiles. And the profile lets me specify particular overrides for a given runtime environment. So I can decide to run my operations as a production compilation step or something, and then, or a production release, and then Relax will, stop, will start including everything in OTP and my stuff. If I want only test, I can override the dependencies and specify that I want mech in there. And what will happen is that we have um, the fancy pants algorithms that lets us merge these prop lists in a way that seems to work all the time. Uh, see. It seems to be repeatable. Yeah, it seems to be repeatable. We haven't managed to do a proof by exhaustion yet. Uh, <laughs> but so far, it seems pretty OK ish. We're waiting for quick checks from Jesper to prove yep. it. So, yeah, so when you run a command as a profile, you do it like that. You have rebar3 as prod release, rebar3 as prod, comma, another word release. So, if I have special compilation, compile options or release options for OS X compared to, I don't know, Linux or Windows, if anyone uses Windows with that, uh, it's going to be able to fetch the particular options, put that in your stuff, and make a special build that's adapted to that. Uh, this is something that we always found extremely painful with rebar2. Uh, we can do it with an environment variable, but that one supports only a single profile. And then when you call rebar compile, it does it. Something interesting also is that some commands are able to say, I always want to run with this profile. So commons like common test or eUnit will specify that they, rust, they run in test commons. So if you do rebar ct, it's going to know in advance that it needs to fetch mech, even if you hadn't done it before. And then it's going to be able to go run the actual test with all these dependencies in scope. The other thing we added while our overrides. So one problem that comes a lot with rebar2, if anyone has dug in that, is that some tuples are inheritable in all your dependencies, and some are not in your configuration. And you just have to know them. There's no quick way to do that. So when you wanted to override something, you had to remember whether it was inherited, and if it was not, you needed to fork the dependencies and do all that kind of stuff. So we got rid of all the inheritance that we have by default. 
And what we do instead is have overrides. So we can decide that for a given application, I want to add a piece of configuration. It's going to be adding it to whatever merging mechanism we have. If you have it with an override instead, it means that you want to replace it. Some things you cannot unset, so you need to really crush the value that exists. You can do it per dependencies or for all of them. So if you want to really just override a given option you don't like in one, and you can do it. And if you want to run, I don't know, the lagger uh, parse transform over everything, you can do it also. So with overrides like that, we're able to crush all the configuration of transient dependencies that you need to actually update by mentioning them. Uh, we have another pretty small screencast there. Really. Yeah, I think that was an important point of uh, a number of things that the configurations stayed the same with Rebar 2, but a number of things that Rebar 2, you, some people might have worked around because they were annoying or intricate features that worked for them in certain situations are going to be some of the pain points in upgrading. But we have features to make those more explicit and more repeatable. So yeah. So for example, right now, we still have the same file. Here we have a relax that by default is going to be in dev mode. It will not include the runtime system. When we run a production compi uh, compiling that we usually generate one and then ship into production, then we can override the dev mode and all these things. But for the regular development you have, you can have very fast releases that work uh, an explicit way, a simple way. So we can also add a few profiles there. That one is going to be adding. Um, the mech dependency to the tests like we do in pretty much any project. Uh, what is cool about that one is that we'll stop shipping mech in production, which I find pretty appealing in general instead of having an entirely duplicated rebar kind of thing that you run just for tests and then you put it to a make file. Not needed anymore. Well, if you're building releases, you wouldn't get mech in production anyway. But <laughs> yep. So yeah, I'm a bit confused with my comments when I do that. So yeah, at that point, I just compiled the test. I had no test to run. It verified a dependency, found that mech hasn't been fetched before, is installing it. And what we do here that's fairly interesting is that everything we had fetched in the default profile, we now transfer the build in a different subdirectory, still in underscore build, but everything is symlink, so we don't need to duplicate it on every single run we do. It's being reusing that, but still giving you a different environment. So when we look at the whole thing, we have the default profile that's at the top here of the screen, and then the test profile is just symlinking to that. The app is compiled anew for the top level, and mech is added specifically in that one. So each sub profile has its own stuff. It can have its own plugins. All the builds are independent like that. And if you use a comment like rebar shell, um, you will be able to have all the things in your path according to one. So you can have a shell for your test cases, a shell for everything regular, and all these comments take care of these profiles. So yeah, I felt angry at rel tool before. <laughs> if anyone has read the chapter about How many people have felt angry at that? But yeah. yeah well, you yeah, can talk yeah. about your chapter. Yeah, my chapter is like, here is how you do a rel op easily with rel tool or something, and it's a 27 bullet point list. <laughs> Don't want that anymore. Yeah, I, I found it easier to not use rel tool and just use the direct tools than to use rel tool. So we wanted to get rid of that. And some people might have heard of uh, RelX, which has been being used by people that use Rebar 2. And it's um, the default release builder in like Erlang.make. So that's what we did. Uh, rel tool is no longer uh, officially supported by the rebar. Uh, it obviously can be used as a plugin or as a standalone, but we believe Relics is the future, and not just because I work on it, yeah. but because it's better. No, it, it's really, <laughs> since Relics came out, people started building actual releases, and it wasn't just not like the people at Bash show it and Jesper Lewis Anderson and two or three other people. Like, since Relics came out, people actually use releases, and we wanted to keep that going. So that's mm -hmm. why we made that editorial choice in the tooling of Rebar 3. Right, it, it, both in providing, uh, in some cases, a limited feature set compared to rel tool, it provides also some more uh, useful feature tools like dev mode, which simply links to the built application so you can compile very quickly, and you don't have to rebuild your application to test any uh, changes you've made. Your, your release is built, it links to it, recompile, you're good to go. Uh, and useful ones, uh, 
have uh, some good documentation and support for cross-compiling to you know, point to this is an ERT that's compiled for uh, CentOS. I'm building on Mac, but I want to include this ERT in my release so I can deploy it. And it, it'll actually it'll build your tar file. It includes all the node tools. So a number of features that were unique to Rebar 2 and not uh, rel tool like node tool and other uh, functionality it gave you is included through rel X. And they've been, uh, thanks to the community, not to, uh, to me, been drastically improved uh, from what, uh, what was first introduced in like node tools. Uh, they work so much better and uh, in more uh, obscure cases. So it's really come a long ways. Uh, and this is a great example. Once again, Fred kind of stole my thunder. I do that all the time. <laughs> now the, uh, so we have uh, rel X. You can also, you can put it in, if anybody's used it already, they're used to rel X.config, but no reason to do that. You can put it right in your rebar config and define what your release name is, which apps you want to include. Uh, we're going to have dev mode because our top level default profile is obviously development. That's what we're doing. Uh, we don't want to include ERTs because what's the point in copying that when we're just developing? Uh, and we want the extended start script. That's just the node tool stuff, uh, all the uh, fun goodies when you don't just want to start your release, but you actually want to do more complicated stuff running in production, uh, but it's still useful for even development. And then we have a profile for prod that turns off that dev mode because we need to have the actual dependencies and not symlinks, and we want to include ERTs in this case, because um, it's more useful for deploying. You don't have to install ERTs beforehand. Uh, you had screencasts to run. You want me to put them on? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, until Timos. That's my laptop, and it's a French-Canadian keyboard, so Tristan is not able to use that. <laughs> Working in an American company, this is like my <laughs> security feature number one. It's you Greek want, to me. Want a template first? I go with a template first. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we updated all templates. These are kind of slow, but that might be good. We'll see how this goes. Uh, Fred's slow when he made these. So Rebar 3 new uh, lists all your templates uh, to give you uh, an overview. And when you ask uh, exactly for uh, the template you want to use, it'll give you some of the variables you can overset and uh, things like that. And so we introduced, uh, well, Actually, I want to point out really quick the CMake one. That's an important one because we don't, we no longer have a C compiler call out stuff in Rebar itself. Run the CMake uh, template, and it gives you a make file that will build your NIF uh, with no changes unless you have an extremely crazy uh, example. You can continue. Yep. That one is slow. The thing is that when I usually work, I type maybe 50 typos a minute, so I have to be super careful when <laughs> Maybe I it's because you have a French-Canadian keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> that can explain it. <laughs> Releases. All right, so we're building a, a release project with a certain name, and it gives us uh, the directory to hold our top-level project. Yep. We have some apps. And we have a rebar config, which I think he'll show first. Yes. Yep. This is the same project we've been using. Oh, yeah, typo there. <laughs> the, so, yeah, this shows us the, uh, the relics config is in there. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter. We'll see it back right there because now you want oh, to. Now we, yeah, now we go to actually building it. Where is it? Really using the tarball. There we go. We're very prepared. Oh, we on time. We actually are. We've been working on this for months. <laughs> There we go. So we're All right, so now, yeah, we have the project, and we're going to look at the rebar config to show that the release uh, uh, configuration is in, inside there, and it's much simpler than anything you've seen in rel tool, I assume, even though we have a, a number of uh, common features. Now we can just simply build it and make sure it's compiled and make sure all the dependencies are there, and it creates it. Yep. And we can also now quickly create a production tar which we see we just link, because we already have those. Uh, I guess we had an extra recon. Wait. Oh, that, that's the example application I built oh. and already edited the entire thing. We just showed okay. screencast in the wrong order. <laughs> right, so. So now that, in which that includes ERTs, and we have a tarball that's deployable, 
and it's right under our build prod for the profile release uh, and name of it directory. So there's our toolbar, ready to go. Yeah, and that's ready to deploy. So that's how simple releases we have tried to make. Um, Really, I don't know how we're doing at time. So is that it? Additional features. Uh, we've got a website with documentation, and we really, yeah. <laughs> this was super important for us. <laughs> documentation is a feature. Anyone who says otherwise is someone I never want to work with. Uh, templates, have we shown them? Common test e unit is in there. We've got edoc, xref, the shell is in there, clean, early DTL, scriptized dialyzer. There's a few more. Show the website. Yeah, I'm going to the website. Yeah. So you don't just think it's a right. GitHub just uh, thing? So you can download the nightly from there. We've got access to the documentation. And really, uh, it's something we're still adding. There's a really easy getting started, basic usage for configuration, this, these things like that. All of that is in there, building, output format, release, target systems, how to build that. Uh, when we mentioned the dependencies, everything we showed in the presentation, we could have just gone to somebody else's presentation and read the website. It's all in there. Uh, how we resolve conflicts, things to do, how that stuff works, it's all explained. We've got tutorials to write plugins because really I don't want to maintain everything all the time and neither does Tristan, so you write plugins please, how to do them. And really, um, the plugins, maybe I'll take a bit of time to show that, yeah, we go. are really, really uh, simple. I'm going to go with the video instead, it's going to be a bit simpler. And then we're going to go with questions. Oh, <laughs> page exists. Stop trying to be. Plugins. All right. It's going to be simpler that way. So this is using um, a plugin I wrote for a demonstration that's on a website. So if you want to add a plugin uh, for any project in Rebar, you really just go plugins. And it's uh, the name of the plugin's provider to do. There is a git source file. It works like any other dependency, and that's it. Like It's on the branch master on Bitbucket. And if I call to do, which is the command that's registered, Rebar knows about it, fetches the thing. You don't have to download them. Even if you don't use that command, Rebar knows that it needs to fetch all the plugins before it proceeds forward with the building of the project. And then it runs the plugin, tells me that in the application, I have a to do somewhere in there. So if I go, well, yeah, typo again, French Canadian. Um, help to do, automatically, every plugin we have has help that is included, linked, and integrated into the system for whatever we do. The plugin is stored in a specific profile. In this case, it's a default profile. It has its own source file. And we're going to look at what a plugin looks like. So what we have here really early on is how you start a plugin. We have three callbacks, init, do, and format error. That's the only thing you want. Um, we have the dependencies, which means that for this plugin to run, I want all the dependencies to be fetched, installed. I don't want them to be compiled necessarily, because I only look at the source stuff. All these dependencies that you can have are documented on the website if you want to build a plugin. I choose the name I want to have, the module, if it can be called, uh, the example on how to call it and do everything. And then please run. Yeah, the, the, the documentation is in there. I call add provider, and that makes it work. Uh, the do one is really based on that simple function call. We pass in the entire state of rebar. There's documentation, again, about how to use it, well, how to extract all the application. But for example, project apps here tells me that all the applications that are at the top level, the user applications that are not dependencies, I want to fetch these. And in that case, it's source depths, uh, because I don't care about packages in that one. And for each of them, I run something. So really, that's a plugin that will go over every source file by running the function over them. Format error is simply outputting stuff. And that's it. This is a plugin. You host it somewhere. You put it into your project. And anyone is ready to contribute. A uh, really cool feature we added with plugins, though. And let me get back to slides, because we had a bit of time there. Common behavior, we have added load namespace. So if you are in charge of a language like LFE, like Elixir, like <coughs> Affine, like anything like that, or you have a suite of tools like Heroku, we have a suite of tools we could want to create rebar projects automatically, you can give a namespace to your project. And then you can reuse the commands that already exist. So LFE compile can define its own compiler. It can call the default compiler that we have. It can use its own. That lets you have your entire suite of tools without having to have the command LFE compile, LFE something. It just compile. You can run them and everything like that. It works with profiles. It works with anything. And it's just an option that you set at the beginning that tells you, I operate in this namespace as a provider. 
So if someone at some point wants to introduce features to upload packages, you could have the package namespace and then package create, package update, package sign, and all that stuff, and we don't have to care about it, which is really a great feature in my opinion. Uh, yeah, before we're done and go to questions, we really, really want to thanks, uh, give thanks to the original Rebar contributors because we use some of the skeleton for that. A lot of the stuff, some of the code comes from that. Alice Dare Sullivan uh, rewrote most of the eUnit and common test suites. Uh, he wrote the cover source coverage stuff, which now works really, really easily. James Fish has handled the dialyzer integration. It still finds a lot of bug. Eric has done the hex PM work. Omar Jardin Yassin has been someone at work who did a lot of trial with stuff, made early versions of a lot of the providers we have. Kelly McLaughlin is someone on GitHub that keeps finding really tricky bugs, and we're super thankful for that, and a bunch of other early users. So yeah, I think that's it for Rebar 3. Any question? Yes, Zach. Does it only support uh, Erlang 17 or is it also supported? Does it only support Erlang 17? No, we're going two versions back. And instead of doing like Rebar 2, which went back as something like R15 or R13. R13. R13, we only want to keep going two versions back and eventually move forward because it's something we want to be able to install globally and eventually use the newer features for ourselves. I think it technically works on R15, but we won't accept patches that are, uh, complicate code in order to support versions t more than two back. Right. Uh, we don't want the rebar code to become legacy because we want to support legacy code in it, basically. Uh, any other questions? Oh, OK. So, so would it be easy to have a get depth that gets them from a cache? Um, right now, the way it works is that to make it easy to add new formats to fetch depth, there is a kind of internal interface for that. I think we would need to have a specific git provider. Uh, we couldn't even just call it git c for git cache or something, and that one could specifically save a local cache. Well, or I, like do that. you mean any dependency, not a git dependency, but to get any dependency like a package or a Git or a Mercurial that's already been downloaded, so why don't we store it somewhere? Yeah, th th it's a future. Uh, it's a feature I always have in mind. Uh, yeah. Where do you put them? Is and how do you make sure the user knows that when they've run out of disk drive, it's because they have secret packages somewhere? Yeah, it hasn't been a priority so far, but right. really. What we have as a feature for fetching a package, it's really give me the version, give me the lock uh, hash I want to save, and give me the package itself, or give me the, the, the content itself. So whatever you can put in there, there's nothing that tells you go download it from that URL. It's really give, here's a source, give it to me. And if you want to override that to use a local cache, it's probably fairly easy to do. Uh, the other, yeah, the other problem that I uh, always ran into with that one is with, with, with packages that have a version number that is fairly simple with Git, uh, I mean, you have to make sure you have the ref. You probably want to go based on that. And then it's, it's a little more complicated when it's branches and stuff like that. Yeah. You want to, like, shot. You want to make sure it's actually, uh, like, the version they want. Yeah. But with packages, as people move to that, it's probably going to become more simpler to have a, a cache right. locally that you just, oh, I've already got Cowboy 1. Use it. There's a lot of new behavior in there also. And as we said, we wanted predictability. So before adding these features that I think are not vital but are very, very nice to have, we want to make sure that basic behavior is at least stable and predictable for everyone. Because after that, it's a lot of different bugs to try to fix. Uh, yes? Is there anything that needs to be done for compatibility with Mix? Is there anything that needs to be done for compatibility with Mix? I haven't touched it. Uh, I, I, do you mean running Mix? Uh, what do you mean compatibility? We've is, is there an issue with that? Or like is there be I mean, they don't work together. Yeah. Uh, uh, mix, in the sense of one, uh, it would be good if there was a plugin that would use Mix to compile Elixir depths that was usable from Rebar 3. That would be nice. It would be nice for Mix to be able to use Rebar 3 to compile. Uh, and like Hex, for example, there's still work to be done. There, you, you can't yet upload packages and stuff like that, you still have to use mix, uh, hex or mix through, hex through mix, but. We're going to have time for one last question, so fight to death for the last question. I see three people. Which one? I don't know. 
Okay, you kept your hand longer in the air. You're more motivated. You get yeah, we already talked to you earlier. <laughs> So Depends on the features. I mean, you don't need, they're both rebar config. They're, they're both rebar config. So the elements that are rebar 3 specific are going to be ignored by rebar 2, and the elements that are rebar 2 specific are going to be ignored by rebar 3. Uh, so the source format, you can, for dependencies, you can specify the same thing. The Earl Ops format is the same. You're going to lose the usage of profiles if someone goes back, but usually it should be both backwards and forwards compatible. NIFs and protobufs are an exception. Uh, you will have to use the compile hooks and different stuff in there with plugins. But yeah, plugin usage is not going to be exactly the same because they don't have the same interface and all that stuff. But mostly dependencies and everything else should work. Uh, Fairly straightforward for the vast majority of projects. We hope to make it easy enough to upgrade that everybody just does it pretty quickly. They, they should be able to do you, that because they both at least try to support OTP applications. I mean, you might have to change your config to make sure it's Rebar 2 compatible, but you'll be able to use it uh, in Rebar 3 to have all the useful the stuff. Thing. All right, well, thank you very much. and. Uh,